Uh, we are going, uh, you know, kind of through the summer. Uh, I'm doing topical sermons right now. Uh, my plan is on August the 11th to do the Lord's Supper. And then August 18th, I'm going to start the book of Matthew. All right, so we will go uh, with topical sermons. And basically what I ask the Lord when I'm looking for a topical sermon is, God, what do our people need? Okay, specifically, what do we need? And I think today's sermon is going to hit everybody because we all have it sometime in our Christian walk, whether we recognize it or not. Folks, spiritual warfare is for real. All right, today I want to talk to you about spiritual warfare. And let me give you the three keys to defeating the devil. Three keys to defeating the devil. If you have a bulletin and want to follow along with note, uh, go to that uh, page there. Number one, identify the enemy. Folks, we got to know who we're fighting, okay? We got to know how they think. We got to know the purpose in what they are doing. And we will explain that. Number two, put on the armor. All right, put on the armor. No soldier with a half a brain in his head is going to go out without armor, okay? Without armor. And Paul, uh, you know, being around the Roman soldiers, uh, matter of fact, one chained to him at times, he would know what they had. And number three, and here's where we drop the ball, okay? All right, let's be honest here. Praying with boldness, okay? You cannot casually pray pray and have victory over spiritual warfare. It's intense. There are times in my life that I feel like Satan himself is standing right beside me. It's that strong at times. And you have to understand Satan is for real. Demons are for real. Okay? They're everywhere. Satan can only be at one place at one time. If he's over in Europe and he seems to hang around that part of the earth a lot, but I'm telling you, he's here too also. He does make it to America. And again, he can only be in one place at one time, and we thank God for that. And Satan has three goals in your life. Three goals. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. Steal, kill, and destroy. Uh, let's start in uh, John chapter 10. Look at John chapter 10. John 10, verse 10, the thief, okay, Jesus is speaking here. He's talking about being the good shepherd and the sheep uh, are Christians. The thief who is Satan does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. What does he want to steal? He wants to steal your peace. He didn't want you to have peace in your Christian life. Two, he kills your joy. Folks, we ought to be the happiest and most joyful people on the face of the earth. But Satan is busy. The Bible says he roams around like a lion. And the third thing is destroy, and he wants to destroy your testimony. He is here to do those three things. But Jesus says, I have come that they may have life, and that they have life more abundantly. And folks, we have to understand, you know, abundant life is not just getting by. Abundant life is not just treading water. Abundant life is understanding who you are and enjoying, uh, you know, uh, who you are as a Christian and to realize that God is on your side. Jesus died for you and the Holy Spirit is inside of you. So that's the three things. Uh, that he wants to do. And we have three enemies also. Three enemies, the last of the threes. The world is our enemy, okay? The way they think. And folks, it's getting, it's going to get worse, okay? They're going to be like Old Testament times eventually if the Lord tarries, and they are going to hate us, and they are going to do things and persecute us. The second enemy you have is your flesh, that flesh is your old nature. Just because you get saved doesn't mean you don't have those old thoughts and things. And that flesh will bring you down. And Satan is real good about it. See, he knows where your goat is tied. He knows what your weaknesses are. And he takes advantage of you. And then the third thing, the third enemy is the devil himself. And uh, folks, if Satan 
went to Jesus when he started his, his ministry and tempted him in three ways, I am telling you, he will be after you also. So let's look at these three things. Number one, identify the enemy. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. He tells us three times to be strong. Folks, our strength is in God. Our strength is in Jesus. Jesus. All right? We, we can build up our spiritual muscles. We can say no to sin. We can tell the devil to, to shut up. Now, don't say it to each other. All right? I, my grandkids, I tell them, don't say shut up. That's right. All right? But if you want to tell the devil, shut up, tell him, just shut up. I'm not listening to you. You give bad advice. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And here's the key, folks. We have the Holy Spirit inside of us. Okay? God is all-powerful. Jesus, uh, you know, was just, I mean, he was the miracle worker. And, and God and Jesus, they left the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. We have things that the world doesn't have. And folks, we need to understand the Holy Spirit is powerful. Now here it is. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The whole armor. And you have to understand, he is sneaky. All right? He lies. He says right is wrong and wrong is right. Matter of fact, we need to understand where he came from. Hold your finger there and go to Isaiah with me. Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah 14, in verse 12. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? And we know the Bible teaches uh, that Lucifer at one time led worship in heaven. But he wanted to start uh, being worshipped himself. And so he got kicked out of heaven. One third of the angels went uh, with him. Uh, if you need a reference, uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse 4. And so he is here on earth. He is roaming around. He is here causing havoc for Christians. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. Now look at these next verses. Five eyes. And you know what these eyes tell me? His biggest problem is pride. Do you know that sometimes our biggest problem is pride? It's just pride. Folks, we need to understand we are nothing without Christ. Christ is everything. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mound of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend from uh, above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. What is he saying? Folks, he's breaking the, the, the part of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no other gods before you. It's Jehovah God. He is the only one we worship. Yet you shall be brought down to shallow, to the lowest depths of the pit. Folks, we went through Revelation, and we know the end story. He will be bound for a thousand years. There will be the big battle of Armageddon, and at the end of all that, Jesus and God will throw Satan and all his folks, the false prophets, everybody, he'll throw them in hell forever and ever and ever. Folks, I'll be looking forward to that day when he is bound. He is bound. Now look back in our text. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities. See, the problem we have, and we make this mistake all the time, that person that doesn't like you, they're really not your problem. That person that you don't like is your problem. Why? Because only you can change that. See, we make people our enemy that we should not make our enemies. 
God will take care of your enemies. We should hate no one. We need to hate sin, but there is no one, okay? Even in marriage, all right? I mean, there's times, and, and I hate the word divorce. I really do. But there are times when, you know, it comes out of their mouth, I hate you. Oh, folks, that should never come out of your mouth, sir or ma'am. Folks, our enemy is Satan. He is our enemy. And we need to understand it's not flesh and blood. People are not our problem. Us letting people get to us is the problem. I like the song, tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. Folks, he already knows. And it takes two to argue with someone. Don't go to the argument. And there won't be a fight. There won't be feelings. And folks, you have to discipline yourself. This is hard to do. But people are not your enemy. And it says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness. Okay? So I'm telling you, there's just a list of Satan and his demonic folks and his, his little uh, demons that run around here. And there's also things that he likes to do. Have you ever noticed people that you tend not to like are around you quite a bit? Do you ever think of why that is? Because you don't like that person. And you're getting tested again. And you're never going to move closer to Christ if you don't win that battle. See, life is full of battles. He'll leave you alone for a while, and then he'll come with a vengeance. I'm telling you, he'll never leave you alone. And those who are doing a lot for Christ, I'm telling you, he's there. He sends demons to mess with those folks all the time. That is spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare. Uh, 1 Peter 5.8. Go with me to 1 Peter 5.8. Look what it says. 1 Peter 5.8, be sober. And that's not talking about drinking, okay? It's talking about be serious. All right, be serious, be vigilant. That means be ready, be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Know when he is attacking you. Identify him as the problem. Because your adversary, what's an adversary? It's an enemy. He's your enemy. The devil walks around like a roaring, roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. I'll never forget going up to by Eureka Springs and that where all them lions and things are. And we were going through there and they, I asked him, we were getting tickets and I said, when is the best time to come? Five o'clock. Why five o'clock? That's when they feed them. So we were getting out of our car about 445 and we just started to hear this roaring and another one would roar and another, hey, they knew the feeding time was coming. And when they really got with it, I'm kind of like, I know there's a fence between me and them. <laughs> but man, I'm telling you, it just put chills down my back. And folks, here's the, here's the deal. The more Satan can get you afraid of him, the less victory you'll have in Jesus. He roars at us. He awakens us out of our sleep. He goes before us when we have a big presentation to make. He wants to rattle you. He wants to make you uncomfortable. And folks, he is real. But my Bible says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. My Bible says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens him. We have nothing to fear. 365 times in the Word of God, He says, do not fear. Folks, I'm telling you, He wants to make you afraid. John 8, John 8, verse 44. John 8, 44 says this. And just notice how long this verse is. This is Jesus' words. You are of your father the devil. And again, he was talking to the scribes and Pharisees. They looked good on the outside. They wore the robes. They prayed on the street corners. They acted like they were spiritual. 
But he said, you guys are really just full of dead men's bones. You are fakes. You, he even called them hypocrites to their face because he knew what they had wasn't real. Okay? They were not believers. You are your father the devil and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand for the truth. Cain and Abel. All right, Cain and Abel. First one. I'm telling you, Satan was saying, hey, your brother or your dad likes your brother better than you. Your sacrifice isn't as good as mine. And Satan was just standing there telling this stuff. So he finally just picks up a rock and kills his brother. And you can see all through the Bible, there were murders taking place. I'm telling you, Satan is behind every shooting that you hear. He's behind it. And he's just laughing because he won. But I'm telling you, folks, he will not win the war. He was murdered from the beginning and does not stand for truth because there is no truth in him. When his lips are moving, he's lying. All right? He's a liar. He makes right wrong and wrong right. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Well, folks, we don't need to lie. We need to tell the truth. We need to tell the truth in love. Folks, Satan is our enemy. Spiritual warfare is real. As long as you are living and breathing, you will, be, you will have uh, satanic forces after you. That's why I love to come to church on Sunday. But you, you know what? This is not an auditorium, folks. This is a sanctuary. This is where the presence of God is. And we come in here. It's kind of like the electric cars. You can only go so far on a battery. We come on here on Sundays. We plug it in, and man, we get jacked up. We're ready to go. But folks, you can't just do that on Sundays. You have to recharge every day in God's holy word. So we identify the in enemy. Now we put on the armor. Look back in our text. We put on the armor. We've had, we have them identified. Verse 13, therefore, take up the whole armor of God. Twice, he says, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand with, within in the evil day, having done all to stand. Which means we're not sitting. We're not being lazy. We're not coasting. Folks, when you are coasting, you are a target from the enemy. When you are backslidden, you are a great target for the enemy. We have to stand. When you are in battle, you are facing your enemy. You want to look them in the eye. You want to go after them head on. And if you walk into my closet, I have all my, my clothes. I have the coats. I have all, uh, you know, just lined up. I learned my wife, <laughs> a Marine brat, <laughs> all right. I learned later on, she doesn't like things in the floor. Some things in the floor is okay for me. <laughs> she wants them in the clothes basket, which I do. But you see all my shirts lined up. You see all my coats lined up. You see all my shoes lined up. And where my shirts are, this shirt right here I put on today, right there is the armor of God. Because I not only need to, and, and please, get dressed daily, put on clothes daily, all right? I got to put on my spiritual armor also. Folks, when I walk out of my house, I don't even have to walk out of my house. All right, I can be in prayer and have spiritual warfare. Put them on every day. There's six pieces of armor here. Look at verse 14, and stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. And the, you know, girded your waist is a belt, a belt. A belt holds things together. And what we need to do is we need to have the belt of truth. Remember, Satan is a liar. We need to be men and women of truth. In my prayer, sometimes it's just like this. God, help me to be truthful today. God, help me not to exaggerate. Help me not to say untruths. Help me to be truthful. Help me to, to, to listen to your word. Your, the word of God is truth, folks. 
The second one is having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And we know the breastplate goes over our chest area and protects the lungs and the organs. And it goes down the part of our back. It's sometimes made with leather or, uh, in, and a lot of times have e- either metal over it or, or, you know, just things that will protect that because uh, our vital organs are important. We cannot get wounded there or we would probably die. So we need the breastplate on. And the breastplate is righteousness. God, every day help me to be righteous. Righteous. Help me to think like you think. Help me to do what you would do. Help me to go where you would go. We need to walk out of our house with truth and righteousness in our mind and in our spirit. The third thing, having uh, shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. They wore cleats like... So in battle, they wouldn't slip, but they had cover over their feet also, because if they had a sword or a club and they, they hit, you know, in battle, hit your feet, you will go down most of the time if there's, uh, you know, something to your feet. And what we need is the peace. God, help me to be a peacemaker today. God, if someone comes at me, if they're mad, help me not to respond like they do. Help me not to give people a piece of my mind. I don't have that much to give. (laughs) Think before you speak, folks. You cannot take words back. Just like throwing a a stone in a lake. You're not going to throw one in a lake and go out there and find it. And words hurt, folks. Be people of peace. The third piece. And above all, the shield of faith. Oh, folks, it's all wrapped up in faith. There was two kinds of shields. There was a small shield for one-on-one battle. And then the one they're talking about here is the big shield. It was two feet wide and four feet high. And even at times, they would make them when the shields would be together. You could lock them together and a wall of people just coming at you like that. Also, they didn't lock them all the time because you would look and in wars, you would see those fiery darts being fired over. And at that time, they could, at that time, you could take your shield and you could get under that two by four and it would just bounce off. A lot of times they would wet that uh, leather and they would wet that before they go in because of the fiery darts. It would catch it on fire if it was dry. And so you see how important the shield of faith is. Folks, faith is everything to us. Our faith in Christ. Our faith in who He is and what He has done. Our faith in God. You take away my faith. Folks, I don't have anything. It is faith. Faith all the time. Which you will be able to quench the fiery darts of God the wicked one. Oh, folks, you've got to be ready. He will throw those darts at you. He will lie. He will spit on you. He will do anything to trip you up and get you on the ground. Folks, we need our faith. We need a strong faith. doesn't matter what everybody else is doing. doesn't matter how everybody else reacts. You react with truth, righteousness, peace, and faith. Then it says, and take the helmet of salvation. And okay, the helmet of salvation. We know the helmet protects the head. And folks, Satan tries to get in our heads. I don't want to witness. Somebody may, may, fun, may make fun of me. I don't want to knock on a door. Honestly, Scott, you know this. That is some of my favorite witnessing. You have no idea what's behind that door. It's kind of like the, th- what was the game show? Three doors, one door number one, door number two, door number three. And when I, what was it? Let's make a deal. Okay? You have no clue what's behind there. And when you go and knock on doors, you hadn't got a clue. And listen, if this is the worst thing that happens to you, I am telling you the Apostle Paul and Peter will laugh at you. They slammed a door in my face. <laughs> Praise God. Folks, there we go again with fear, folks. We cannot fear. 
Satan wants to get in our head. Do not be afraid. You know how else he does? He gets in your head thinking, well, I can't. Well, I've taught my kids early in life, even when I was coaching when I was young. Don't tell me you can't. Don't tell me you can't. One of my favorite verses, you know it, and I've already quoted, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Folks, you have God looking over. You have Jesus walking beside you and have the Holy Spirit. So we need the, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Man, we have a sword, a two-edged sword. And you notice that the sword is the only offensive weapon that we have. Everything else is defense. But that Word of God, folks, that's why we have to memorize the Word. You're not always going to have to, oh, wait a minute, devil, let me look that up in my Bible. No, you got to have it right here. When he's attacking you, you just start spitting those verses out at him. And I tell you, he hates. Hey, say the name of Jesus. He hates the name of Jesus. And we need to be ready. We need the sword in our hand. Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4. Verse 12. Man, this is powerful. For the Word of God is living. Folks, it ain't dead. This is not a dead Bible. This is not gone out of print. It's the most read literature in all the world. The Gideons, just like last week. And by the way, we gave over $3,800 for Bibles last week. Thank God for that. They can buy many Bibles with that. And we thank you for your giving. For the Word of God is living. It is powerful. Man, it has a punch to it. It has a punch. It is powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It can cut you coming and going. When God wants to humble you, he'll throw a verse at you and you'll go, oh man, I didn't do too good on that one. All right, folks, we need that in our lives. We need the Word of God telling us truth. Don't just read it, live it. Believe it. Walk truth. Piercing even to the vision of the soul and spirit. Oh, folks, I've been in witnessing situations and I'm sharing the gospel and walking down the Roman roll, road with somebody. And this has happened to me more than one time. And when I get to, if you confess your sins, uh, uh, no, not that one, uh, the one in, uh, in Romans uh, 10, verse 9, all right? I am telling you, sometimes about that time, tears will just roll down their face because they, they realize for the first time that they are sinners. Folks, it takes two things for somebody to be saved. The Word of God. We share the Word of God and the Spirit of God convicting them for salvation. And He is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, oh, folks, God knows how we think. He knows our motives. He knows how sincere we are. He knows how deep we go with Him. He knows when we're lying. He knows when we're stretching the truth. He knows when it's absolute truth. Folks, the Word of God changes people's life. Psalms 119. Psalm 119, verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation day and night. Folks, we need to identify the enemy. We need to put on the armor. And the third thing is we need to pray with God boldness. Pray with boldness. Folks, I cannot tell you how important prayer is. A growing Christian needs to pray at least five times a day. A growing Christian. You start your day with prayer. You start it. God, I mean before when I wake up, I start a prayer right then. Amen. God, help me to live for you today. God, help me to say no to temptation today. God, help me. God, would you give me a divine appointment today? God, would you bring me somebody in my life that I could just help today? And then I get dressed spiritually and for work. Three times, if you're eating out, doesn't matter where you eat. Man, you pray. You bless the food. That food came from God, folks. That is a witness to other people around it. 
I've had many people, after I pray at a restaurant, go by me when they're paying their ticket and just say, hey, I, it was so good to see you pray. Matter of fact, me and a buddy was riding. Uh, we went to Jasper on our motorcycles, and this is several years ago. And we were eating, and of course we prayed before. And I went to pay, and this guy handed me a note. This lady and her husband, they paid for your meal. And it said, you give bikers a good name. Keep up the great work. I would have ordered a steak if I'd known that. <laughs> But that hamburger and french fries, have you noticed free food is better? Have anybody noticed that? <laughs> Folks, people watch us everywhere we go. Now, I don't so much look like a biker, but David Lovett, who is a great guy, great friend, you look at him and you think, biker dude. <laughs> All right? And so it's an awesome thing. Everywhere you go in life, you need to pray about it. And then the last prayer is the most important prayer, folks. Absolutely. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You've got to ask yourself three questions. Number one, am I right with God? Am I right with God before I go to bed? Number two, am I right with my family? Sometimes you got to pick up the phone. Sometimes you got to go in a kid's bedroom. Sometimes you have to call somebody on the phone. And am I right with my fellow man? Folks, we need to be right with God. We need to be right with our family. We need to be right with our fellow man. Look what verse uh, 18 says. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. That's the key. Don't pray from your flesh. Don't pray. You know, they called, you know, James and John the son to thunder, thunder because, man, they were praying down. Get them, Lord. Destroy them, Lord. You know, all right? Let God decide that. Pray for your enemies, the Beatitudes tells us. Prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this, end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. We intercede for others and for me that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. This is the Apostle Paul. How bold was he anyway? And he is saying, pray for boldness. Pray when you, when you feel that Holy Spirit telling you to say something, to say something. Share the gospel of Christ with people around you. That's what he is saying. That I may boldly to make the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, in that I may speak boldly twice as I ought to speak. You know what had happened? He'd be chained to a Roman guard. He'd win that guard to Jesus, and they'd try to sneak him in food and water. They'd take the guard away because of that. And so they just bring in a new person in that he has to, you know, you know, he, he, he gets to talk to and shares Christ with. Folks, we should share the gospel. We need boldness in our sharing. Romans 1, 16. Romans 1, 16. Look what the Bible says, and we're finished here. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew and also for the Greek. You were saved. God saved you. He wants to save others. He wants to use you to save others, to share the gospel of Christ with. Proverbs 11.30 Proverbs 11.30, the Bible says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. You want to be wise? You share the gospel with others. Folks, I'm telling you, it is such a great feeling when you're able to share the gospel and somebody gets saved. Don't be afraid don't be afraid. In the last verse, Psalm 126, Psalm 126, Psalm 126, 5 and 6. 
Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. A thing that is missing in the modern day church is tears. Folks, I'm telling you, I have been in revivals meetings. I remember one time a lady come down the aisle and later on I talked to her. She was praying for her husband and she was crying so loud they had to turn the speaker's mic up because she wanted him to be saved so bad. I was young and I still remember that. He who sows in tears shall reap in joy. Verse 6, he who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed in sowing, uh, sowing, shall doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing the sheaves with him. Let me take the pressure off of you, okay? It's not your deal. It's not your decision who gets saved and who doesn't get saved. That's a God thing. Your job is to share the gospel and let God do the rest. Three questions I want to ask you, and they all have to do with faith. Number one, have you experienced saving faith? Are you truly a child of God? If you are not sure, please come down during invitation. We would love to share the gospel with you. Number two, do you have a living faith? There's a saving faith, that's salvation, and a living faith in your daily life. Are you practicing faith in your life? And number three, are you sharing your faith with others? Are you sharing the gospel with others? Father, thank you for this day. In God, Satan is real. He's having a heyday in some people's lives. And God, I pray, Lord, that we would look at these things. God, I pray that we would be men and women of prayer. I pray that we would put on the whole armor of Christ. And God, I pray that we would have victory in Jesus. God, if there's one person here that does not know you, God, I pray today would be their day of salvation. God, this is your church. This is your invitation. Would you just speak to hearts this day? God, we can have victory in Jesus. God, I pray even those who know somebody that needs to be saved, I pray that maybe they would slip out and they would come to this altar and they would just pray for that person. God, maybe Christian need to rededicate their life to Christ. I pray that you give them the boldness to come forward. God, I pray if there's those here that need to follow the Lord in baptism or join the church, God, I pray that the Holy Spirit would speak to them. God, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you for this day. They're not here by accident. You have brought them to this place. And God, I pray, folks, all over this building, God, I pray they would listen to the Holy Spirit and obey. God, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come? We thank you for joining us this morning at Rye Hill Baptist Church, and may God richly bless you.